screens. It's blue skies over Kennedy Space Center, pad 39A. Weather's looking good both in the local area as well as when we head northeast towards the space station, the ascent trajectory looks good. So at T-minus one hour and two minutes, all systems are go. All right, well, you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft that is in the final stages of preparation to launch the world's first all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station in just over one hour from now. Today's launch marks the next step in evolution of the human spaceflight story. This is the first of a number of planned private astronaut missions, or PAMs, by Axiom Space to the International Space Station, and it represents the culmination of years of hard work between both government and private entities to open up the doors to low Earth orbit. My name is John Rackham, and I am the Crew Systems Deputy Manager at Axiom Space, based Current out of Houston, Texas. For awareness, we are cycling orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure. All right, just some back and forth there between the crew uh, and the core. Uh, my name is Kate Tice. I'm the Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Uh, with our coverage now expanding to NASA television, I'd like to welcome friend from NASA, Dan Hewitt, uh, coming to us from Johnson Space Center over at Houston, Texas. Hey, Dan. Hey, Kate, great to see you and the Johns. We're excited to join and get this milestone mission off the ground. <laughs> Liftoff time is still holding, uh, let's see, for 11.17 a.m. Eastern time uh, and currently tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. Uh, the range remains green, and as you can see there with that shot, the weather is definitely cooperating. Yeah, it's a beautiful day for launch. <laughs> what, a, what a gorgeous <laughs> shot. Now, over the last three hours, Axiom astronauts Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Mark Pathy, and Aton Stiba donned their SpaceX suits in our new suit up room uh, and were then transported to the pad where our crew entered the SpaceX Dragon, Dragon spacecraft that you see there live on your screen. Right, and since arriving at the spacecraft, our crews were helped by the closeout engineers or advanced team to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air and a communication link to Dragon Systems. And at that point, they conducted successful leak checks and communication checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person dedicated to speaking directly to the crew throughout the mission. The closeout team then sealed the hatch, uh, which also gets its own leak check. Um, unfortunately, that leak check didn't pass the first time, right. so we opened it back up, wiped it down, and performed that leak check again. Uh, and that second one was good, good so one. that leak check is closed. Or excuse me, that side hatch is now closed. Uh, moments from now, the closeout team will depart the pad uh, while weather operators kick off their final check on wind speeds at the pad uh, before the final go, no-go for launch. But before we get to that final go, no-go, uh, the SpaceX team will do an internal poll, making sure conditions are ready with Falcon 9, Dragon, the crew, the range, and the weather. Uh, let's pause now and watch uh, with that, uh, watch the closeout crew as they uh, finalize their preparations there on the pad.
As you can see, the crew there on the right-hand side of your screen continuing to wait another 57 <laughs> minutes until uh, we lift off from pad 39A, which you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we can confirm that the closeout team has departed uh, the, the access arm there, um, so that's good news. Now, as the countdown continues, let's take a moment to get reacquainted with our crew today. So the AX-1 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, a Spanish-American who was born in Madrid, Spain, and is also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. Michael is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz, so he has quite a bit of flight pedigree. He has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, accumulating 67 hours and 40 minutes total in the vacuum of space. Both of these landmarks are NASA records. In 2021, he was inducted into the, NASA, into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Um, you might hear us call him L MLA a few times around here, so if you like acronyms, uh, here's a new one for you. <laughs> the pilot for AX-1 is Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur, nonprofit activist, investor. He's won, uh, excuse me, he's won aerobatic flying competitions and has summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through AX-1, he'll become the first private pilot to reach the ISS. He'll also become the first human to reach Dragon both... SpaceX, you are go for section six of four decimal 100. When ready, report go for launch. That's in work, SpaceX. All right, so just some uh, back and forth with SpaceX core Arthur Burial and the crew um, continuing to work through our procedures. Um, Ultimately, next check will be to make sure that the crew inside Dragon Endeavor are go for launch. Yeah. Uh, back to our pilot, Larry Connor. Um, as I said, he, uh, he will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. That's, that's just crazy to me. <laughs> Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. This mission will add a new dimension. Go for launch. Copy that endeavor. Cruise, go for launch. All right. So that is yeah. fantastic news. Um, that's basically four thumbs up inside yeah. <laughs> uh, Crew Dragon right now. Um, yeah, so really good news there. Yeah. So continuing out our crew, moving on to Mission Specialist 1, Eitan Stiba will become the second Israeli ever to fly to space. In many ways, today's mission is a return to flight for the nation of Israel after the Columbia tragedy in 2003. Eitan served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal, and today he is an impact investor and philanthropist. In collaboration with the Ramon Foundation, the Israel Space Agency, and the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology, and the Ministry of Education, Stiebel will fly to the ISS under the Rakia banner and the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. During his time on the ISS, Stibo will facilitate scientific experiments, educational outreach, and one of my personal favorites, artistic activities. Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as mission specialist number two on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy, Pathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Dons LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy will become Canada's second private, a private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go to space. All right, well, you've seen the vehicle, you've met the crew, you've heard some good calls on our way to launch, and we're just within the hour. So let's send you over now to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where Dan Hewitt is following the launch prep from Mission Control in Houston. Dan, over to you. Hey, thanks, John. And the team behind me flying the space station, the crew on board, they're ready to get this first private astronaut mission off the ground. Back in 2019, NASA took steps to open the station up for business, issuing a directive to enable new commercial activity on board, including private astronaut missions. And all of this is done with the goal of building a robust economy in low Earth orbit. Now, why does NASA want to do that? Well, we're very aware that there is untapped potential in that space just outside of 
of our atmosphere, and low Earth orbit can be a first step towards unlocking limitless possibilities. On this July 20th, 1969. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Greatness. Boy. <laughs> Cannot always be seized in a moment. Sometimes it requires a first step. A step into the unknown. Not knowing the path, but understanding the goal. Believing that the first step leads to greatness. We've touched the sky. Believing it will lead to new worlds. We've left our home. Believing in a brighter future. We've come together. Believing in shared goals. We've stayed and learned believing in benefits for all. take the first step time and time again because we've witnessed its benefits and believe in its potential so we're expanding and enabling this step for others to push humanity further as we prepare for the next giant leap we'll always need this first step we're here to stay and now is the time to join us. And low Earth orbit is that first step. And for NASA, we're in it for the long haul. For the last more than 20 years, we've shown that you can get incredible value from doing research and technology demonstrations in low Earth orbit on the station. And along the way, we've continually increased our work with commercial organizations, flying research, payloads, entire facilities, experiments. Uh, and working with U.S. companies to fly cargo and crew to the station, the latter of those laying the groundwork for the mission we're seeing about to launch today. Uh, and we're continuing to look ahead onto the horizon, working with companies like Axiom and others to get a jump start on developing new destinations in low Earth orbit where future astronauts and not just those from NASA will be able to go and explore and do research just outside of our atmosphere. So we've got our sights on the horizon and our ultimate goal is for NASA to become one of many customers in this new economy in low Earth orbit as we set our sights on deep space exploration uh, heading back to the moon and beyond under the Artemis program. Now, the AX-1 mission is a good example of the public and private partnerships that are going to make that future vision a reality. But to take a little bit deeper of a dive, let's jump over now to my colleague, Megan Cruz, who's standing by at Kennedy Space Center with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Over to you, Megan. Good morning to you, Dan, and good morning, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Great to have you here, as always. Good morning. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk to you because we know that one of NASA's goals has been to enable commercial efforts in space. With today's Axiom-1 mission, the first all-private crew to the International Space Station, what does today represent for the agency? We're taking commercial business off the face of the Earth and putting it up in space. And that's one of our main uh, programs now because we want to get NASA out of low Earth orbit and go explore the heavens. Uh, we want to direct our energy and our resources to do that because we're going back to the moon and we're going to Mars. And uh, so uh, we want, for example, we're going to continue the space station for another eight years. Yep. Uh, we want to have commercial space stations. NASA wants to become uh, the ability to lease uh, uh, space on a commercial space station instead of having the responsibility of the space station. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that because I know that we've seen success with commercial cargo missions, commercial crew missions. Are commercial stations next? Uh, indeed. Well, that's what we're doing today. We are bringing a commercial company to our ISS. We are then going to have them attach a commercial module to the International Space Station. 
and then we're encouraging the building. We've got uh, uh, initiatives out there in private industry right now uh, to build a commercial space station. And then all of our international partners on the space station, we're taking with us out into, for example, lunar orbit. The Gateway, which is like a space station in lunar orbit, is uh, going to be a number of nations uh, landing on the moon. We're going to have other uh, nations participate as well. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of partnerships going forward with NASA to accomplish some of the big goals that we have. Well, as it should be, because our program is internationally, and when we go to Mars, uh, there's going to be a delegation from planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Are you excited for today's launch? Oh, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Administrator. I really appreciate you being here, and I hope you enjoyed today's launch. Thanks a lot. All right, back to you guys at Hawthorne. We're at T minus 46 minutes, 10 seconds. We've just heard from the SpaceX launch director. Brief to CE or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence and immediately proceed into launch abort. In T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent occurring per drag and manual escape flight rules. For those operators in firing up four, in the event of a fire alarm, key operators noted in 57.83 will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Fire group four and MCCX will go into a sterile cockpit and lock down for the duration of the time the launch escape system is armed. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Over that, arming crew arm for movement. Crew arm for movement. T minus 45 minutes and counting. You've just heard the SpaceX launch director give the final execution instructions to the launch crew team. Access arm retraction started. We're ready for propellant load. That'll begin in about 10 minutes. Before that, we've got crew access arm to retract happening now, and then arming of the launch escape system. Everything continues to look good for an on time launch of Falcon 9 with Axiom 1 mission. Dragon SpaceX for tablets. As we prepare to step into LES arming, uh, I need you to verify that the elastic bands are over the corners of all of the iPads in the vehicle. that. Thank you, MLA. And for awareness, that last call came in pretty quiet, so if you could speak up on the upcoming calls, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay, we'll give you an update here inside of 43 minutes. Crew access arm has retracted from the Dragon spacecraft. Next up, we've got launch escape system arming. And then at T minus 45 minutes, or T minus 35 minutes, we'll begin loading propellant onto the Falcon 9. So right now, Falcon 9's go, Dragon's go. Weather looks good, and the range areas are also cleared for launch. So Kate, John, everything is looking good.
Inside of 42 minutes, everything continues to go well. Waiting now for a launch escape system arming. Endeavour SpaceX for launch escape system. Go ahead, Arthur. All right, MLA, at this time I can give you a go to step through section seven of four decimal 100, close visors and arm the launch escape system. That should work. SpaceX Endeavour, visors are closed. We are arming the launch escape system. Dragon SpaceX launch escape system is verified armed. Copy SpaceX. All right, there you heard it. The launch escape system is now armed. You can see there the crew in their seats with the visors down. Uh, launch escape system, um, you know, is the first of its kind escape system. Um, it provides escape capability all the way to orbit. It's a really uh, important function to have. Um, obviously, no intention of using it today, um, but that's what those callouts were there um, back and forth that we just heard. Right, and as you heard earlier too from Administrator Bill Nelson, um, you know, the importance of low Earth orbit. So speaking of just how valuable low Earth orbit is, the crew of X-1 will be conducting a tremendous amount of science over the course of their eight days on board the ISS. And not only does that include 25 Axiom managed studies, but it also includes the Axiom crew participating in efforts that extend far beyond this mission. Some of those we actually looked at earlier. One of these broader studies is a series of health monitoring tests before and after the flight. A few days ago, I was able to connect with Dr. Emmanuel Riquetta to talk about the ongoing research this crew will participate in on behalf of the Translation Research Institute for Space Health, also known as TRISH. Here's our conversation. Dr. Riquetta, welcome. It is wonderful to get to talk to you. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us, what is TRISH? Absolutely. My name is Emmanuel Riquetta, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. And I'm also faculty at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. The Translational Research Institute for Space Health, or TRISH, uh, we're partners to the Human uh, Research Program at NASA. And one of our main goals is to find and fund new disruptive research that is high risk but potentially high reward, uh, with the end goal of keep um, humans healthy both in space and on Earth. And we have been working with commercial spaceflight missions uh, since last year, and Axiom 1 is our fourth commercial spaceflight mission. That's really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about your primary areas of focus or what you're studying on this mission? Yeah, so Trish uh, focuses mainly on the high priority areas uh, of, of human um, space flight research. And um, I would say the three highest priority areas are radiation, um, behavioral uh, issues that come from being isolated and confined in space. And the third one is how your body changes 
uh, while you're in a different uh, gravity field, either a, a zero G environment like in space or during different gravity fields uh, when you are uh, in, in the moon or Mars. Okay, interesting. So what kind of systems or hardware are you working with specifically to capture this data? For this mission, the hardware that we're using is uh, absolutely optimized uh, to provide, number one, the, the highest quality data, while uh, you know being still easy to use, easy to implement, uh, and being the lowest burden to, to, the, um, uh, to the astronauts. So to collect all of this data, for example, uh, vision changes, we have been using a, a small device is uh, roughly the size of a shoebox that you can see here, have this here with me. So this is basically like having uh, an optometrist uh, on a box. Basically, the only thing that you have to do is just, just grab it, uh, put it on your eyes, uh, look uh, at an object that is roughly six feet away from you, and after a few seconds, you get uh, a prescription of, of your glasses is right here. So as I was saying, um, if, if there's any changes on, on astronauts during these missions, we'll be able to see how the changes with this device. Uh, we're also looking, I was mentioning, at behavioral changes, how uh, being in, in, in an isolated and confined environment has any behavioral aspects. And for this one, we have been using a, a small tablet like this one, also to test the sensory motor adaptation, the, the balance disorders and the space motion sickness, uh, we're using a device like this. And for each of the, of the crew members, we have a set of hardware like this, and um, uh, it fits, uh, the four sets of hardware fits on a, on a medium-sized um, suitcase. So it is, it is really easy to move uh, wherever it needs to go uh, for, for launch and, uh, and landing. That's wonderful. So what are some of the intended outcomes or goals of the research you're doing? Yeah, so some of the outcomes uh, and one of the main applications, um, number one for spaceflight that, that, that we want to get from, from this research is that short duration missions like uh, Axiom 1 are very, very relevant in the context of Artemis missions. When we go back to the moon, the first missions are gonna be roughly the same duration as, as Axiom 1. So anything new that we learn from these missions is gonna be absolutely valuable. Really, every new piece of data we collect in spaceflight could potentially solve and be that, that uh, last piece of the puzzle that we're looking to, to complete uh, what we need to know. Well, Dr. Riketa, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We wish you the best of luck. It is my pleasure, thank you. All right, we are about 30 minutes out from launch of the historic AX-1 mission. It has taken an enormous effort from an incredibly dedicated and hardworking team to get to this moment. And that team wanted to take an opportunity to wish the crew of AX-1 well and Godspeed. Hey, AX-1, we're so happy for you guys. I just want to let you know we've got you here on the ground in mission control, so fly high and have some fun. From all of us here at the Integrated Performance Team, we want to wish you luck on your pioneering mission to the ISS and hope to see you in a couple years when AX-H1 launches. It is not only an immense honor to get to watch your monumental mission, but also to have been able to support you on your journey towards this day as well. Hey guys, can't wait for this mission. We put a lot of hard work in. We're excited for you all to uh, have a great time up there and good luck. Thank you for helping set an important precedence ahead of a very bright future. Good luck, AX-1 crew. Let's conquer space. Hasta pronto. We want to send you all off with good wishes in this incredible journey. Godspeed. It has been such an honor to watch and support you guys as you prepare for this moment. I'm so proud of each one of you for the dedication, the long hours, and the hard work you put into making this a meaningful mission. Hello, Axiom astronauts. Thanks for stepping up to the plate for this amazing journey. You guys have trained hard waited a long time and this is now happening. Safe travels on this historic mission for the first private astronauts to go to the ISS. It's happening. Wave to us from up above because we'll be thinking of you from down below. We're the Axiom Safety Team. We just want you to know that we are really proud of you and we've got your back. We're wishing you a safe and successful mission and we'll see you when you get back on the ground. Hi guys, we're the Axiom Soft Goods team and we just want to wish you a good mission and get back safely. It's a real pleasure to be talking with you guys right now and we're super excited for you. I'm here to cheer you on along with the entire crew systems team. Yay. Thanks for everything you're doing. you all the very best, the greatest of success, and the most fun and the most challenging, interesting thing in your life. Go big and enjoy your time on the ISS. We'll see you back on the ground.
Hey guys, I am so proud of the Axiom One crew. It's so fun to be a part of something bigger than you and to contribute. Most important thing to remember guys, take some time to look out the window and appreciate where you are. It's space. We're T minus 31 minutes and 40 seconds counting down to the first all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. A few minutes ago, Falcon 9 propellant loading began on time at T minus 35 minutes. RP-1 fuel loading is underway on both the first and second stages. Liquid oxygen loading is underway on the first stage. Now we'll finish up fuel loading on the second stage at about T minus 20 minutes. Doesn't take very long and then we'll begin loading liquid oxygen on the second stage at about T minus 16 and a half minutes. We'll continue propellant loading on Falcon 9 up until about T minus two minutes. Now speaking of propellants, the Dragon spacecraft was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road from the launch site at what we call Dragonland. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. Start of stage one, cryohelium loading. For the fuel, we use monomethyl hydrazine, or MMH, and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for oxidizer. Now together, these propellants feed the Draco engines that will maneuver Dragon on orbit, changing its attitude, uh, raising its orbit to get to the space station. But that propellant also serves a second purpose, and that would be to use in the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an escape scenario. But right now on pad 39A, nice view of Falcon 9 with Dragon there. You can see the crew access arm has retracted away from the Dragon spacecraft. The four-person crew is inside Dragon right now. The launch escape system is armed, propellant is going into the Falcon 9. So since we are at this stage with launch escape system arm, that means the eight Super Draco engines inside the Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. We have the ability to use a launch escape system right now if it was needed. A couple other status items. Weather, as you can see, looks good. Probability of violating the launch commit criteria is less than 10%. The only thing we're watching is wind gusts, but we believe, having seen the, the wind for the last several hours, everything continues to look good. That should not be an issue. Weather is also good in the Atlantic Ocean should we need to use a launch escape splashdown site for the Dragon capsule. We've also got upper altitude winds we've been checking out uh, balloons have been released by the range here recently. We continue to look good for upper altitudes as Falcon 9 through, flies through the periods of max, maximum dynamic pressure. And finally, on the range, of course, we have cleared the danger areas, the hazard, the caution areas. Everybody's out of there except the four-person crew up in the Dragon capsule, very top of the rocket you can see in the picture. So coming up, T minus 28 minutes, 30 seconds, everything continuing to look good on Falcon 9 with Dragon for the Axiom 1 mission. Let's take a moment now to get acquainted with the vehicles that you see there on your screen. That's a live view of Falcon 9 with Dragon, uh, our spacecraft on top. Falcon 9 rocket is a rocket, um, to the Falcon 9 rocket with the Dragon spacecraft on top uh, together stands about 215 feet, which is almost 30 feet taller than the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy, oh, <laughs> which is 130, uh, 183 feet. Um, Falcon 9 is a reusable two-stage liquid-fueled rocket, uh, which means that it's kind of like two rockets in one, the first stage and the second stage. Very cool. So talking a bit about that first stage, the first stage is the bottom two-thirds of the vehicle that you see there. has that nice patina. It's been reused a, a little bit. Um, it's covered in soot from a previous mission. That first stage is responsible for accelerating Falcon and Dragon through the Earth's atmosphere and into space. To do that, it has nine Merlin engines at the bottom of that first stage. Prior to liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage is loaded up with nearly 1 million pounds of fuel and liquid oxygen. And the Merlin engines on the first stage are optimized for sea level. Uh, these achieve 190,000 pounds of thrust during ascent and descent. 
The first stage accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere into space and then separates the rest of the rocket at about two and a half minutes into flight. From there, the first stage will do what no other orbital class rocket in the world can do. It'll make its way back to Earth and target a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of gravitas, which you see there on your screen. The seas look great. The blue skies, I, I don't think it could be any more picture perfect. No, it's like a desktop right there, I think. <laughs> Uh, our drone ships are essentially autonomous, powered spaceports that allow our rocket to land over the ocean. Uh, for reference, our drone ships are equivalent to the size of a football field. So uh, while it may have looked kind of small on your screen, they're actually pretty ginormous in real life. <laughs> it's got to be to hold a rocket, right? Um, as, as mentioned previously, Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket. It's two rockets in one. Above the first stage is the second stage. Now, the second stage has a single Merlin vacuum, or MVAC, engine, which ignites after the first stage. Separates. Now, the second stage is essentially a smaller version of the first stage, and whereas the first stage is designed to power the vehicle out of Earth's atmosphere in the forces of gravity, the second stage is specifically designed to operate in the vacuum of space. The second stage powers the Dragon spacecraft to its specific, specific targeted drop-off point in orbit. The Dragon spacecraft is capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. Uh, but for today's mission, it is carrying four members of the Axiom-1 crew. It is the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space station and the only spacecraft currently flying that is capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth. Like the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, the Dragon spacecraft is also reusable. Today will be the third flight to space uh, for this Dragon spacecraft uh, that the Axiom-1 crew is flying in today. Uh, the previous flights for this, th this capsule supported were uh, recently the Crew-2 mission and before that the Demo-2 mission, uh, which was our first human spaceflight mission. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Now, as we await T-0 and just under 25 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of this mission will look like. Right, so once we hit T-0, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket or what we typically refer to as Max-Q. It's worth noting that once we hit Max-Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. The first of which is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which, as the name suggests, that is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event. Right, now SES-1, or second engine start one, is where the Merlin vacuum engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our AX-1 crew, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first stage is the entry burn, where three of the Merlin 1D engines will reignite and then shut down. This helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its singular Merlin engine uh, that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn, which is a single engine burn, will bring the vehicle's speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship uh, at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while Falcon 9's first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Now, once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. 
And lastly, the nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and finish around T plus 15 minutes. Uh, and this sequence will expose Dragon's docking mechanism in advance of its arrival at the International Space Station. So, uh, as you can tell, it's it's a pretty jam-packed 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay close attention to what you're listening to. Don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with all of that in mind, uh, let's head back over to Dan Hewitt for an update uh, from the ISS team over at Johnson Space Center. Dan? Hey, thanks, Kate. Now, inside the room, the International Space Station Flight Control Room, Flight Director Scott Stover is leading the teams right now. But just about four hours ago, NASA Flight Director Diane Daly gave a go on behalf of the combined ISS team to the SpaceX uh, Mission Director, just saying that ISS or the space station was go for launch. Now, to get there, we've got a list of flight rules, basically just guidelines for all of the major systems we have to make sure are functioning on board station before we can give a go to launch another crew up there. So we're looking at everything from those core critical command and control computers, verifying we have a good communication path through our tracking and data relay satellites, uh, ensuring that the atmosphere, all of the life support systems on board are functioning, even the mechanical systems like the docking port where this mission is headed. So. We're expecting today's flight to be about a 20 and a half hour journey from launch to docking uh, with the Crew Dragon Endeavor headed towards the Node 2 Zenith. That's the space facing port on the top uh, of Node 2, the Harmony module on board the station. And once they get there, they're going to get welcomed by the Expedition 67 crew, which is made up of seven individuals right now, four from our SpaceX through Crew 3, 445 for the teams over in Hawthorne. And so once they get there, they'll be able to get out of their suits uh, on board the Dragon spacecraft uh, while the team on board station moves into what's known as uh, uh, the hatch operations. Uh, station Commander Tom Marshall is going to be pressurizing that small area between Dragon uh, and the station hatches. We expect it to be a little under two hours from docking to hatch open, and then we'll welcome the AX-1 crew on board the space station. So a lot to come with that 20 and a half hour journey, but all that's going to start with a launch. So I'll send it back over to Hawthorne as we get into the final phases of the countdown. Back over to you, John. Right. Well, Dan, as you mentioned, it all starts with the launch. And, Kate, it's looking like it's getting pretty busy here. People are excited about seeing a launch, right? Yeah. We're just now under 20 minutes until liftoff. Um, as you could probably tell by the, the noise, uh, the crew here, excuse me, the, the, the crowd here in Hawthorne, uh, we're at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, um, is starting to gather uh, just beyond mission control here uh, in the building. And uh, you might be able to tell by the ambient noise. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the live production noises that you also hear. You know, we are in a rocket factory. Um, but yeah, you can see there the crowd is starting to grow behind the mission, the team there at Hawthorne Mission Control. Now we saw Dan speaking earlier from uh, Mission Control in Johnson. There is a Mission Control Center uh, in Florida where the SpaceX teams are also gathered um, in firing room four. And then we have the, the launch, or excuse me, the Mission Control Center here. Uh, there's a, a shot of our firing room four there in Florida at Cape Canaveral. You can just uh, barely make out pad 39A there in the distance there through the window. Um, might be wondering why all the different mission control rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, the one in Johnson, uh, as Dan was saying, you know, that's really mission control for the International Space Station and those operations. The control room that you see there is for everything leading up to launch. Um, as soon as Falcon 9 lifts off, uh, responsibility and control transfers to Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne. Uh, so just a Quick explanation for why right. why so many rooms with computers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and in addition to all the teams gathering here, we've got teams of our own gathering in Houston at Axiom headquarters. You can see there on your screen Axiom Mission Control with uh, the lovely Axiom family behind them looking in proudly. All right, well, you know, Dan mentioned that, you know, first we have launch, 
Then we got rendezvous and docking, and then we've got eight days of jam-packed activity on the ISS. So busy. <laughs> yeah, and, and docking day is not, it's not just a ride to space, right? You, you get up there, you open that hatch, and crew is working. I got a little chance to look at some of their timeline. Um, and as soon as they open that door, they are getting invited in. They are getting trained on some uh, emergency procedures and then stepping right into payload activity, stowage transfers, um, and just generally getting acclimated. But they're working before they go to sleep, and the work doesn't stop there. <laughs> Um, it sounds a lot like everything leading up to launch itself. You know, everything is scheduled, mm -hmm. planned. Um, even, you know, we know that even sleep time is scheduled yeah. on the ISS. Um, it's something that's uh, incredible to me is that not only do you have work to do, but, you know, your science experiments and that kind of stuff, not only do you have to get some sleep. <laughs> or you can. Um, you also have to exercise, right? Yeah. The exercise time, uh, which can be a couple hours. Stage two, lock photo started. All right, so good news there. We have begun LOX load, uh, liquid oxygen loading on second stage. Uh, so that is currently underway for first and second stage, as well as loading of RP-1, uh, which is our fuel on both first and second stages. Right. Right, and again, you know, some of those things that he talked about, it's all following a timeline, right? And we are listening to, for those important cues along the way that we're hearing on these nets or on the loops, um, uh, listening for where are we along in that timeline so we know exactly where we are in terms for launch as we count down at just T minus 15 from launch. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking uh, at my dashboard here. It looks like fuel load on second stage is now complete. Uh, so we're re beginning that LOX load as we just heard. Um, LOX load and fuel load continues on uh, first stage. Axiom crew continuing to wait, yeah. <laughs> following along with everything happening there uh, with the touchscreen uh, displays there above them, as well as their tablets strapped to their legs. Right. Everything continuing to look nominal for liftoff in just about 15 minutes. And as we approach uh, that liftoff in these final moments of our countdown to launch, Axiom Space founders Cam Gaffarian and Mike Suffardini wanted to take a moment to reflect on this mission. Well, this moment for me and Michael is a very special moment uh, in a beginning of many beginnings, right? The launch of AX-1 uh, going to International Space Station as part of our journey to build the first private commercial space station. And we're so grateful to be here and delighted uh, at this moment as part of this incredible journey to commercialize and privatize low Earth orbit. On behalf of Cam and I, we'd like to thank the entire team that's made this historic journey possible. The SpaceX team in particular has done a tremendous job of prepping our crew for a launch on their transportation vehicle. The crew itself has done a fantastic job of getting themselves ready and planning their research. NASA, of course, we can't do this without NASA's leadership and support. And to each of you in the Axiom Space family, we couldn't have done it without you. We're looking forward to a bright future together. T minus 14 minutes, seven seconds, and continuing to count down. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon. That'll occur 17 minutes and 12 seconds after the hour. As a recap, Falcon 9 began propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. We just heard loading of the RP-1 fuel. The kerosene fuel on stage two was completed right on time at T minus 20 minutes. We've still got fuel going on to the first stage. Looks like we're about 90% or so full right now. Fuel loading will finish up at T minus six minutes and we'll hear that call out in the countdown. Meanwhile, densified liquid oxygen is continuing to load onto both the first and second stages. First stage will close out at T minus three minutes. The second stage, we just began loading liquid oxygen at T minus 16 and a half minutes just a few minutes ago. That'll wrap up at the T minus two minute mark. Now we load the liquid oxygen as late as we can in the countdown. It's densified, that means it's ultra cold, well below the boiling point of liquid oxygen. That lets us put as much as we can on the vehicle for performance and getting it on board the vehicle just before liftoff means it won't warm up where you start to lose uh, the ability to put liquid oxygen onto the stages into the tank. Uh, in the quantities we want. So it stays nice and cold, it doesn't bleed off, and that gives us the performance we need on Falcon 9. Continuing on, Falcon 9 checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles, you may hear that term, they're coming up. 
We're also going to be doing throttle valve checkouts on the Merlin engines. That helps control the power of the engines as we go through flight. For example, you hear a throttle down and a throttle up as we prepare for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. As we come up on the 12 minute mark, the range continues to be go. Uh, roadblocks are up, all the hazard areas are clear. Airspace, sea space is good. The weather is go. Beautiful shots you can see here, blue skies. I'm looking forward to some great views from the cameras as we head into space. And then finally on the Dragon side, the Dragon mission director and team, they're reporting no issues. We've done the communication checkouts with the crew. You can see the crew access arm has retracted into the launch position. You can see Dragon now with the strung back of the transport director and the umbilicals going to Dragon alongside of it. We've also armed the launch escape system and obviously the crew is strapped in the Dragon capsule and they're ready to go. Final instructions of the crew will come in about a minute and a half at T minus 10, we'll listen to that. The crew displays will be configured for launch and that setup will give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and it provides constant updates on vehicle health. The T minus five minutes will be in the terminal count for Dragon. Dragon will transition to internal power, going to its onboard batteries and off of the external ground power. We're gonna hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we go from T minus 10 to zero. And then as we fly after T zero and liftoff, we'll hear callouts as we head into space. And that'll be letting the crew know as they reach each of the milestones. Now, next big event coming up at T minus 10 minutes is we're going to do launch commit criteria and final instructions will be going to the crew. One other thing that you will hear is during ascent, you may hear one alpha, one bravo, two alpha. These are launch escape states. As the Falcon 9 flies, if a launch escape was required, the crew on board knows where they are passing various points in the countdown, and that would tell Dragon what sequence of events to execute to come off of the Falcon 9 and bring the crew back safely down under the parachutes in the ocean. Right now, T minus 10 minutes, let's listen in to the countdown now. Dragon, SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX and Never, we confirm they're configured. Copy MLA, and on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, we're honored to have you aboard Endeavour for its third flight to the International Space Station. Axiom 1 marks a new step in commercial space flight and research. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. Thanks for those words, Arthur. I've got a few of my own. I'm going to let my crewmate eight times say it first, though. Shalom. כמה ימים לפני שאנחנו מציינים את המסע הגדול שלנו לחירות. And a few minutes before launching on this journey, I wish to share with you the words of the Greek poet Constantine Kavafi that well described the perspective of, of our marvelous crew. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you this marvelous journey. X1, Rakia. Thank you, Eitan. I'm going to continue far less elegantly or eloquently, but uh, as we sit here on the precipice of this new era in human spaceflight, we do so on the shoulders of professionals at SpaceX, NASA, and Axiom. We um, want to thank all the teams at SpaceX, uh, Falcon 9, Dragon, the launch team, of course, closeout team, and all of the folks in mission control. Um, and of course, our training teams. With NASA voice, it's been tough, you know, the first time is always hard and there's no playbook. It's all open field running, but with ISS program, commercial video development and flight operations, we've learned a lot and we'll continue to do so. We want to thank Cam and Seth for their vision, but especially all the people at Action for putting this mission together with the mind of miracles that they performed. 
all of you, make no mistake, are the men and the women in the arena. Your faces are marred, if metaphorically, by the best sweat and blood, and you strive valiantly. You will have no place with the cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. The crew of the great ship Endeavor is ready to sail her proudly, Arthur. Some heartfelt words there. Stage one, engine chill has started. All right, so there was the call that uh, we have begun to chill the engines on the first stage. So what we're doing right now is flowing a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen uh, through the turbo pumps on those M1D engines. There's nine of them at the base of the first stage. Uh, and that's essentially bringing them down to the temperature of that super chilled liquid oxygen to uh, prevent any thermal shock to the hardware. Uh, and just before that, call some really heartfelt words from yeah. Commander MLA uh, and Mission Specialist Aton Stiba. Um, really love hearing that commentary. Stage one, RP load is complete. At this point in time, the at this point in time, uh, fuel is fully loaded on both the first and second stage. Locks loading continues uh, on both stages. Coming up on five and a half minutes, Kate's let us know that we've got the fuel load complete. Next is coming up, we're T minus five minutes. Dragon will be transitioning uh, configuration for terminal count and going on its internal battery power. Everything continues to look good as we're counting down. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks are pressing for strong back retracts. Heard the call out. We're pressurizing the tanks for strong back retract. We'll hear a sequence momentarily. Strong back is retracting. Actually, that's the start of about a one minute sequence. In about T minus four minutes, the clamp arms that you can see there will open. And then, the, and then we will see the retract from there. So we've heard the call out. That's the start of the sequence. Doesn't mean that the clamp arms uh, are late opening. It will take us a few more seconds. As you can hear, the excitement and the crowd is really growing oh, yeah. uh, here at SpaceX headquarters at Hawthorne, California. There you can see the clamp arms have begun to open. And next we should see the strong back uh, begin to retract. This structure is what we basically use to transport uh, the fully integrated vehicle to and from the hangar, uh, from the hangar to the launch pad. And there you can see that strong back retraction has begun. Everything continued to look phenomenal uh, as we're now under three and a half minutes until launch. RP-1 fuel is fully loaded on first and second stage. Uh, should be wrapping up locks load on uh, the first stage momentarily and continuing to fill on second stage. Stage one, lock load is complete. We're under three minutes until liftoff of the Axiom-1 mission. Dragon is the in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard that Dragon is on internal power. Um, as I was saying, we're getting close. The crowds are growing. The excitement is palpable.
can see there on the left-hand side of your screen Mich Mission Control here in Hawthorne, California, just behind where John and I are. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that looks like Axiom Mission that Control. That looks like Axiom Mission Control in Houston, Texas. Everybody's waving and saying, hey. All right, at this point in time, that locks load on first stage is complete. So the first stage is now fully loaded with all of its propellant. Locks load on second stage continues. As we've mentioned before, stage two lock load is complete. All right, so there's that call. At this point in time, Falcon 9 Dragon is. Dragon is an auto idle. Dragon is fully loaded with all of its propellants, nearly 1 million pounds of that propellant. Next event coming gas up that started. right now, venting. the gas closeouts. We have finished pressurizing the storage tanks on board the Falcon 9. They gave the crew the heads up and they hear some loud venting noises. We're also going to vent down the liquid oxygen line that carried the locks up to the second stage generates a typical large white cloud of condensation around the strong bag. Big event coming up now, T minus one minute, all the flight computers take over. Let's listen in to the last minute of terminal count. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX Endeavor, we acknowledge, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. plus 38 seconds into this historic mission, flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9. All right, telemetry nominal. Stage one, throttle down. Throttling down in the preparation for max dynamic pressure. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Merlin 1D engines coming back up to power. Copy, 1 Bravo. The crew calling out 1 Bravo should a escape situation arise. It tells the Dragon flight computer what profile to fly using the Super Draco engines. But everything is looking good on Falcon 9. We're getting nominal call outs from all the engineers. And a great view from the ground camera and the onboard cameras. In back chill, underway. Beginning to chill in the second stage turbo pump in preparation for its ignition coming up in just over half a minute from now. Coming up on about three and a half G's acceleration for the crew. We'll begin throttling down the Merlin engines to hold that, period, that level of acceleration. Next event coming up, we're going to get main engine cutoff stage of the one, line engines. Down. Get stage separation and ignition of the second stage engine. 
You've heard the throttle down call out. We're holding three and a half G's for the crew. And Miko. Successful stage separation ignition of the second stage engine. On the left, the titanium grid fins beginning to slowly deploy. Great views from the first stage camera. The first stage now begins a slow flip maneuver. You can see the white uh, nitrogen gas plumes as we reorient for an entry back through the Earth's atmosphere a little bit later in the plus count. Second stage, we see the engine nozzle glowing red. Everything continuing to look good on the second stage. We should be hearing call outs coming up to the crew here shortly on how the trajectory is looking. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. It's what we like to hear. Signal Bermuda. AOS Bermuda acquisition of signal. The Bermuda tracking station now getting telemetry from the second stage of the Falcon 9 with the Dragon on top. T plus four minutes, 10 seconds. Everything continues to be nominal. First stage coasting to Apogee, and then it will come back down for landing on the drone ship. Second stage partway through its lengthy burn to get the crew into orbit. So Kate, four and a half minutes in, everything continues to look good. What a absolutely picture perfect liftoff. We've got a live view of the crew inside Dragon Endeavor. Looks like uh, everyone is still pretty comfy. Uh, as John had said earlier, we got Dragon to. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. All right, good call out there that trajectory is nominal. Uh, Endeavor, we copy. As John mentioned, we got to about three and a half G's there. Position of signal, New Hampshire. On the left-hand side of your screen, we can see the first stage as it is making its way back down to Earth. It's targeting a landing on our drone ship, a short fall of Gravitas, which is parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Second stage on the right-hand side, everything continues to be nominal there as the MVAC engine is powering the second stage and Dragon Endeavor, Dragon Endeavor to its targeted drop-off orbit. Absolutely beautiful views of both the first and second Dragon stages. Dragon trajectory nominal. All right, so coming up in about a minute and a half, uh, the first stage will execute the first of two burns required for today's landing attempt. Um, at about T plus seven minutes and 30 seconds, we'll see the entry burn begin. That's where the first stage will ignite um, the center engine first, and then a couple seconds later, ignite two more engines, so a total of three engine burn, um, which will last about 29 seconds. The entry burn slows the vehicle down significantly as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. The first stage sees high drag, which scrubs roughly 70% of that velocity by the time that the landing burn begins. Stunning view where you can see the curvature of the Earth there on the left-hand side. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. SpaceX is never weak, copy. There you can see the nitrogen gas thrusters. That's the puff of um, gas that you see there occasionally. That's used for uh, attitude control systems. We also utilize those grid fins that you see. There are four of them uh, placed around the booster. Uh, and those grid fins also help steer for a precise landing. Um, either at Stage the one entry burn startup. 
stage two flight All preparation. right, there we can phase. see that that entry burn has begun. We are targeting a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas today. Everything continuing to look nominal with trajectory and uh, MVAC performance there for our second stage on the right-hand side. So we are conducting the entry burn. Previously, the booster Stage was... Stage one entry burn shut down. That entry burn helped slow the booster down. It was going about 25 times the speed of sound. So we slow it down as it re-enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. The next event is second engine cutoff, or SECO. One, as you see it there on the timeline at the bottom of your screen. Stage that's, two in thermal guidance. That's where we shut down the MBAC engine, or second Stage engine cutoff. Copy, Shannon. Stage one transonic. Note that our landing burn and second engine cutoff uh, will occur about the same Endeavor time. All right, we got a live view of the crew inside Dragon Endeavor there on the right hand side of your screen. Stage one landing burn. Landing burn has begun for the first day, Dragon first stage. SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. All right, great news there. Dragon Endeavor, nominal orbit insertion. SpaceX Endeavor, we copy and it's great to be here. Zero G and we feel fine. Stage one landing leg deploy. SpaceX Dragon launch skip system disarmed. As you can see, this Falcon 9 has landed for the fifth time. All the while, great commentary Stage there. Confirmed. While we can confirm the landing. Confirmed landing there of the first stage booster. Also, almost simultaneously, great news uh, for the second stage. We heard that there was nominal orbit insertion uh, for Crew Dragon Endeavor. There you can see a live view inside our Dragon. Looks like the crew is beginning to adjust to zero G. And if you look at the right hand side corner, it looks like indicator. we can see the zero G indicator. Yeah, that was one of my. That, that was one of the things I really wanted to see what they were going to bring for their zero G indicator. So I can't wait to see what comes on. It looks. I can't quite tell. Pokemon? <laughs> uh, maybe, okay, well, hopefully it'll it'll come into closer view. Yeah, but and if not, we'll get to ask them later, hopefully. Yeah, great to see the crew here again, starting to, like, really getting their first taste yeah. of microgravity. Yeah. Oh, it has ears. Oh, it's a bunny. It Is that like Thumper? I think it might be. I think that's Thumper from Bambi. <laughs> Love it. So right now, uh, the second stage is basically preparing for uh, dragon separation. Um, we are, the next step now that, uh, as we said, dragon has nominal orbital insertion, the second stage and dragon will separate. Views there of our uh, MVAC engine, now shut off, no longer glowing that lovely shade of orange. Right now, the second stage is about 200 kilometers above Earth. Preparing now for stage separation. Excuse me, for dragon separation. For those of you that have just recently joined us, we had an on-time liftoff of the Axiom-1 crew. They are now in space and uh, are coming up to separation from second stage, at which point um, they will then begin to make their journey, continue their journey uh, to the International Space Station. The view that you're currently looking at is inside the Dragon trunk, which as you can see has just separated from the second stage. On behalf of the Falcon 9 team, welcome to space. Thanks for flying Falcon 9.
guys enjoy your trip to that wonderful space station in the sky. Do some great research for us. We'll look to see you back here underground. Now stand by for some words from LD. And MLA and, and uh, the rest of the crew endeavor. Glad we got to have some fun this morning. We'll probably be calling an early weekend over here at the Cape. Pass you over to Anna and the team. You'll be in good hands. Godspeed, Endeavor. Enjoy the rest of your flight. Cheers. Hey, Mark. It was a lot of fun. I venture to guess we had a little bit more than you did. We thank you and your launch team, Gersh, you and the Falcon 19. That uh, was a hell of a ride, and we're looking forward to the next 10 days. All right, some nice words there from a couple of key folks. My first Quindar tone of the yeah, mission. Yeah, I queued up right when I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> there we can. Expected, expected loss of signal, Bermuda and New Hampshire. There we can see uh, Dragon Endeavor on its way to the International Space Station. It has separated. There's a view Track inside. Six, we have nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. There we can see over the shoulder of... SpaceX Endeavor, we copy that. Over the shoulder, previously Commander uh, MLA was on the left and pilot uh, Larry Connor was on the right. Live view inside the cabin. They just got the okay to lift their visors. Right. All right. So we can see that everyone is in space. Yeah. We can see that zero G indicator floating around. Great view there um, of Dragon Endeavor. Now in space with the Axiom One crew oh. on their way to the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, this is a day of firsts. You know, this is my first time getting to participate in a launch like this. This is the first for Axiom. I mean, this is a first for space flight. And it's just wonderful to see such a picture-perfect picture launch. It really was. We saw, we saw the landing, <laughs> and we saw uh, orbital or uh, uh, zero-G insertion at the same time. I mean, that was perfect. Yeah. It was wonderful to see. All right, well, as I just said, today's launch is one for the history books. So to punctuate this milestone that NASA and commercial companies are able to achieve together, we go now to Kennedy Space Center, where Megan Cruz is with NASA's Kathy Leaders. I am. I'm here right now with the Associate Administrator of NASA's Space Operations Mission Director. It's so great to have you here, Kathy. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the launch? Oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's always like, you know, right in the bottom of my throat. I'm yes. holding. I can't breathe. Can't breathe. Yes. But what a beautiful, beautiful sight. Yeah. So good to see it. I, I want to tell everybody working Artemis 1 wet dress, we're off the range. We're off the range for Axiom 1, and we can get moving. But um, you always want to hear the engine cut off. You always yes. want to hear that second stage engines lighting. You always want to hear, you know, each of these stages and we need to just keep carefully working through the different steps to get the, that crew there to the International Space Station safely. Yeah. What does Axiom 1 represent? Axiom 1 and also future private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. Hey, you know, NASA's original goal was to enable commercial industry. That was actually in our original Space Act agreement. And so here we are, you know, 60 years later, enabling that through our missions. And so I just feel like this is a culmination of 60 years of work for yes. us. And here we are once again getting to see, and for the first time, the first time getting to have commercial you know, private astronauts going to the International Space Station, and they'll get to see what our government, the what they're calling professional astronauts, yeah. doing their real work. And but they're also getting to do their work too. And it's a, uh, it's another place where learning to peacefully work in space, I think, is moving us forward. Yeah, so important. And you know, we just watched Axiom One lift off from that launch pad right there behind us. In a couple of weeks, we're going to see Crew Four launch from that same launch pad. And then yeah. just right next to it, Pad 39B, we have NASA's brand new space launch system. Can you recall a busier time we've had here at the Space Coast? <laughs> and how is Kennedy Space Center managing its new role as this multi-user spaceport? So I think somebody else, this is, I mean, Bob Cabana had this dream of a multi 
multi-user space sport here. So I think he should be very, very proud of his <laughs> KSE team. And Janet Petro and her team are obviously leading the way right now because this is not easy to do. It's no, not it's easy not. to go make sure all these people have all the capabilities and are obviously working with our Air Force uh, sister agency there too and making sure that all these launches get supported in a seamless way. Just an amazing job. Yeah, a lot of juggling that has to happen. Yep. So, you know, I just talked about SLS. We are looking forward to the moon with that launch mm -hmm. later this year. You know, why is it still so important to maintain a presence in low Earth orbit when we're looking towards the moon now? Because we still don't have everything figured out how to do things yet for the moon and Mars. And really the cheapest place for us to see a differential gravity environment and for the long term is still LEO. Yeah. And so we've got to continue to do these long duration flights, keep doing our medical protocols, keep doing our physical protocols, keep testing out our equipment through those long duration missions. It's the only place where we can do that right now. Yeah. And so we still need to be able to have this kind of a test bed for us to be checking out and proving our protocols, our research, our technology before you go put somebody in a rocket that's going to go to Mars, right? Yeah. So just like always, we prepare, we get ourselves ready, and a low Earth orbit destination is a perfect place to do that. And again, how does us fostering commercialization efforts in space, how does that free us up to pursue these other dreams that we have as an agency? So, you know, the administrator today in, in the um, pre-mission conference, he said, you know, we right now are doing, this is our first step. We're working with a, a commercial company to have them come to our International Space Station. And yeah. we're learning to work together and figuring out how to work together. And this is going to be an important step for us because moving forward, we would actually like to now be able to buy a ride and time on orbit yeah. with a commercial company to be able to have them do that. And so this is the first step of their learning from us and us learning from them. And then in the future, you know, we're going to have space station for another eight years, but we would like by the early 2030s for us to be flipping the roles yeah. and have our professional astronauts going up and, and checking and doing and focusing on the research and technology we need for exploration but allowing commercial providers to be doing the hard work of maintaining the laboratory. Kathy, what an exciting future. I'm looking forward to seeing it, and thank you again for being here. Thank you. All right, back to you, Dan. All right, hey, thanks, Megan. It is great to see the AX-1 mission on orbit. The team here uh, with the space station are ready. We're ready to get them on board. So their journey just started. They've got about 20 and a half hours until they're docked to the space station. Again, they're headed for the Zenith port on Node 2. That's the space-facing one on the very top. Uh, with that docking scheduled right now for 11.45 GMT on Saturday. Uh, that is just about 6.45. I have a, a feather in my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather. En la NASA, nuestro recurso más importante es nuestra gente. Una fuerza laboral talentosa, diversa. Dedicada a estudiar los secretos del universo y de nuestro planeta natal. Para el beneficio de la humanidad. La comunidad hispana contribuye a diario a misiones esenciales de la agencia. Trabajando para mantener seguros a nuestros astronautas y misiones en órbita. Monitoreando los efectos de cambios climáticos. Prediciendo eventos meteorológicos que pueden afectar a nuestras comunidades. Ayudando a la respuesta en desastres. Diseñando los aviones de tecnología sostenible del futuro. Desarrollando ciencia y tecnología a bordo de la Estación Espacial Internacional. Desentrañando los orígenes del universo. Buscando señales de vida antigua en otros planetas. ¡Hemos llegado! Perseverance llegó y preparándonos para llevar a la primera mujer y a la primera persona de color a la luna. 
Nuestra diversidad de orígenes y culturas impulsa nuestra capacidad para innovar y hace que nuestra agencia sea más fuerte, incluyente y diversa. Somos hispanos. Somos hispanos. Somos hispanos. Somos hispanos. Somos hispanos. Somos NASA. Sigue nuestras historias en NASA en Español.